Hi everyone, welcome to The Parenting Pickup, a podcast simply made to help families with trending topics and so much more. We are positive you will pick up tidbits of helpful tips, tricks, activities, and advice when listening to our podcast. I'm Alex. And I'm Angie. Thanks Thanks for for listening. listening. Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of Parenting Pickup. And before I get into the topic of conscious discipline, I do want to let you guys know that Angie, my co-host, is no longer with the company. So if you're wondering why she's not chiming in with her comments or opinions here and there, it's because she is on a new adventure. So just wanted to start off with letting you guys know. We do have a special guest, Jessie Grittner. Um, She is a Conscious Discipline Coordinator, so welcome, Jessie. Thank you. Happy to be here. And um, when I first heard Conscious Discipline, I was confused. And also, discipline just seems like such a negative word. So when I first heard about Conscious Discipline coming into New Horizon Academy, Um, I just thought, what the heck is this? Like, it just sounds negative and kind of scary. Do you want to go into what the actual terminology of conscious discipline is? Yeah, absolutely. So that's a little bit of a misconception, a common one, um, because conscious discipline actually doesn't have a whole lot to do with our traditional view of what discipline is. Um, So what conscious discipline is, is it is a comprehensive trauma-informed social and emotional learning model. Um, It was written by a woman named Dr. Becky Bailey. And what it is, is it's a skill-based program to help educators and families resolve conflicts, enhance brain development. Um, It creates optimal learning environments, supports self-regulation, and just strengthens relationships um, through learning these skills and these powers, um, as well as practicing, like I said, those self-regulation skills. Um, and it is based on a brain state model that allows us to see behavior as communication and then in turn be able to create this culture of we, um, where we're learning and teaching new skills, um, creating connection and then problem solving. And then, um, with conscious discipline, um, what I thought was interesting is that not only is it for mainly teachers, like for our company, it's for teachers to practice conscious discipline, but also parents. This can benefit parents for sure. And it's almost like we do want parents to learn this first before teaching their children. And we'll get into that. Um, Yeah. So we started conscious discipline here at New Horizon and then Kinderberry Hill about four years ago. Uh, We were introduced to it and trained in it. And then we realized how much of a profound impact it was having on the schools and the teachers that were using it, as well as obviously the children in the classrooms. Um, And so we created a position at our company that I took over um, to just really put intentionality behind the training piece of it. We're adding some coaching and mentoring and workshops and that kind of thing um, to build it throughout our company as a whole. So... Mm -hmm. And with conscious discipline, it's not just discipline. It's regulating your anxiety and stress and learning your emotions. Do you want to kind of go into all the things that it does cover? Yeah, absolutely. Um, So it is solely based on self-regulation and self-discipline. And Dr. Becky Bailey kind of has the foundational piece be the brain state model. And so what the brain state model is, is it's a tiered model that provides a way to show the relationship between the internal brain state and then external behavior. Um, And it's based on three different brain state models. So the first is the executive state or the thinking brain. Um, And this is our conscious brain state. So we're aware of the things we're doing. We're able to override impulse. Um, It's our optimal brain for learning and thinking and problem solving. Um, And so we always say a person who is in this brain state or a child who's in this brain state is always asking, what can I learn? Um, How can I problem solve? That kind of thing. And so um, this is obviously the ideal brain state that we want a child or even an adult to be in in order to learn. Um, And then the two other brain states are unconscious brain states. So the first is the emotional state. Uh, We're going to see this one in kiddos a lot, um, specifically in early childhood, just because their prefrontal lobe hasn't even really started to develop yet. Um, So this is one we're going to see a lot. And in this state, they are asking the question, am I loved or do I belong? 
um, and it's really asking, am I connected? So when our emotional state is frustrated or triggered, it's like a file on a CD-ROM um, that's filled with past experiences and learned inner speech. And so when our buttons are pushed, or we always use the term when the world's not going our way, the emotional state is activated. Um, for a person who's in this brain state, um, you'll commonly see more verbal behavior, so things like blaming, attacking, back-talking. And this is for, um, like, any age, too. Yep, absolutely. So we see it a lot in adults through their inner speech coming yep. out, things that maybe they heard their parents say, that kind of thing. Um, and same with children. It's going to be things like tantrums. It might be, um, like I said, talking back or blaming someone else for something. Um, so all of those more verbal behaviors. Um and then the last brain state is the survival state. And so what this state is really searching for is safety. Um, that's the question it's asking is, am I safe? And this is activated under, we say, either real threat or perceived threat. So it can be something that we might not see as a threatening situation or a threatening thing, um, but a child or adult sees it that way. And so that's creating some sort of unsafety for them. Um, and... Like, right away when I hear that, I think of, like, fight or flight. Like, yeah. Like, they just can't even think. Yep, absolutely. And so we talk a lot about you have specific skills that are available to you in each brain state. And so for this brain state, it is you either have the option to fight, flight, or freeze. Um, and you're, again, searching, searching, searching for safety. Um, and so with that, you're going to see a lot more physical behaviors for children and adults that are in this brain state. So for children, it's going to be things like hitting, kicking, biting, running away, those kinds of things. Um, it could be hiding, crying. And then for adults, it's kind of the same thing, right? It might come out in a little bit healthier way. It could be, you know, you just shut down and you want to be by yourself. It could be more physical, like you run or you do some sort of exercise to get that out, that kind of thing. Um, but it is going to be more of those physical behaviors. So mm -hmm. More than the vocal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. That's so interesting to me. Yeah. <laughs> and I've definitely been in that state where, like me, I do get anxiety, where I do shut down. And I've also been like, okay, freak out and you're not able to breathe anymore. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And it can be very external for some people and you'll be able to really tell like, ooh, they're in their emotional state or survival yeah, state. Yeah, it's then like for a blackout others, for me. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. Yep, because that's that, that stress, mm -hmm. stress release. So yeah, so like I said, conscious discipline is kind of based on these three brain states and that the behaviors we're seeing are communicating something and then we need to adapt our approach depending on um, on the behavior. So yeah, that's so interesting because yeah. people usually see their toddler, for example, having a meltdown. They don't realize that they need to get into this other brain state. They're already at this third brain state where they like are losing control. Yep. So then that kind of goes into like, okay, what can we do to help them with yep. that? I think that that's super common is being flustered or being frustrated by a behavior that someone else, again, whether it's a toddler or a child or another adult is showing. Um, and what that tells us is that we are being triggered or our buttons are being pushed. And so we can just as easily move into a lower brain state. Um, and so one thing Dr. Becky Bailey talks about with conscious discipline is it truly is an adult first model, right? So we need to check our own self first before we approach a situation. Sure. Even like me with my son, I've, and when he was a newborn, especially, mm -hmm. I could tell my, I was losing myself and it was like, okay, I need to breathe because I'm going to do something really bad or stupid if I don't control myself first. Yeah, absolutely. And unfortunately, you know, sometimes those things are unconscious. We say something and then immediately we're like, oh crap, I shouldn't have said that. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so what conscious discipline is helping you do is it like I said, it's helping you realize, oh, this is how I'm feeling. Um, these are the words I'm saying, and this is why. So that in the future, I can hopefully be aware of it before I respond, take a pause, breathe, and then approach the situation in a little bit more effective or healthy way. Mm -hmm. um, and so with that, like I said, state dictates the behaviors we see in others. It also dictates the way that we perceive others' behavior. So... Um, for example, if I'm in a survival state, I'm going to perceive any behavior, any words, anything as a threat, right? I don't feel safe. Um, whereas in a, 
Whereas if I'm in an emotional state, I might, you know, see someone's, something someone's saying to me or doing to me as attacking me or blaming me for something. And so then I want to defend, right? I want to stop the behavior. Um, I, it might cause disconnect, that kind of thing. Um, and then that ties back into where conscious discipline really comes in is it helps us to realize when our intent isn't to teach or help um, so that we can take that pause and move ourselves into a higher brain state and hopefully respond in in a way that is going to benefit the situation as opposed to maybe breaking a connection or creating a an unsafe environment. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of like you said, like the adult first model. If I'm in my emotional brain or my survival brain, I can't approach that situation calmly. Like I physically can't access those skills. So I might know better, right? I might know, oh, they're crying and they're crying because they're hungry or they're upset or they're tired. But because I am not in my right brain state, I can't see it as that. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And then everyone kind of feeds off each other yeah. too. Yeah, it just way. creates a little bit of chaos. <laughs> <laughs> so a couple pretty universal techniques that we talk about is um, breathing is a great tool to use for a child that is really just um, dysregulated, distraught. And so you're going to see this, like I said, in more of those physical behaviors. Um, and what breathing does is it cuts off that stress response that's causing them to fight or flight or freeze. Um, and so conscious discipline offers a couple just like kid friendly breathing um, activities that you can do. Uh, but what it really is, is we want to take at least three deep breaths and that will shut off that stress response, um, which will hopefully move that child into a higher brain state. Um, and then connection activities are also super important. So we're going to see this in, again, that emotional state, which is really, really common in younger children. Um, when we're hearing things like tantrums or when they're whining or, um, you know, talking back or saying no, there's some sort of disconnect that's happening. And so implementing just little moments with them, um, things like a special handshake or pat a cake is a really great one. It gets that connection piece in place. Um, to rebuild that connection, again, is going to move them into a higher brain state. Um, yeah, because even um, younger children don't even understand their emotions. Mm -hmm. They don't know what they're feeling and how to feel and how to act. So... Mm -hmm. And it is super important to teach those, right? We want to make sure that we're um, giving opportunities for them to learn about emotions and learn about how their body's feeling when maybe they're angry or they're sad. Um, so using tools like emotion books and postings. Mm -hmm. um, Feelings charts. Yeah, I've seen. <laughs> absolutely. And it feels unnatural sometimes as adults because it's like, oh, I'm warm, right? Like that might mean that I'm angry or I'm sad. And so, shh. So saying out loud to them, oh, your face is going like this, or you look sad, is going to really help them in the future to create that inner speech of when I'm making this face or when I feel this way, that means that I am feeling sad or angry or happy. Yeah. So, What would you feel like is the most important thing to get out of conscious discipline? I think the biggest thing is to begin to recognize behavior as communication um, and not only our own behavior, but the behavior of others. And that is, like we talked about, it's first gonna really help us calm and see the situation in a different way. Um, and it's going to then help us be able to use the skills and the things that we've learned or that we know to help others, um, whether it's children or adults. Um, and then the other really big thing that conscious discipline stresses um, is connection. So we talk a lot in early childhood about there's no magic fix for, for behavior and that kind of thing. And I would venture to say that connection comes as close as it possibly can to the magic fix. Um, conscious discipline is based on the school family model of just really making sure that you are creating safety and connection within the classrooms and within the home. Um, and that is going to, you're going to see a lot less behaviors when those two things are in place. Mm -hmm. So Definitely. Um, so we do have a couple questions from parents um, that um, it does relate to conscious discipline in some sort of way. Um, so Juan has a question and he says, what happens if I give my child choices and they don't pick one? This is one of my favorite questions. Um, so we all know choices are a great thing, right? To offer two positive choices really builds independence, builds um, that sense of freedom a little bit. 
Um, and like I was talking about before with the brain states is we only have access to the skills that are in the brain state that we're in. So chances are um, that your child is not in the right brain state to make a choice. So we talk a lot about how choices are a really great tool in the emotional state. So it gives an assertive direction like it's time to come and sit down at the table, for example, and then we give two choices, right? You can walk to the table or you can hop to the table, but in the end, that end goal is being met. Um, and so for a child who's not in their emotional brain, that's going to be really stressful for them. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, absolutely. So I encourage you to use just the assertive language. Um, and what that would look like is it's time to come and sit at the dinner table, walk to the table like this, and then you actually show them whether it's helping them and motioning them towards it or you physically walking over there. Um, that's going to be helpful. Um, and then we have Carrie. Uh, she says, I'm having a hard time getting my daughter, who is three, to breathe. She won't do it with me. What should I do? Okay. Um... So the simple answer is this is going to be just that emotional dysregulation that's happening. Um, sometimes children are just too distraught to take that that helpful tip, right? Okay, breathe with me. And they're like, no, or they just can't access that. Um, and so what we encourage adults to do is to just reassure them you're safe, right? I'm here to get you through this. Um, and then if you can start visually breathing so that the child can see it, what's going to happen is um, the mirror neurons in their brain are going to start subconsciously breathing with you, which is going to help them calm down. And then hopefully you'll be able to kind of go from there um, and implement some tools once they calm down a little bit. I've even seen, I don't know if this is related, but the like breathing ball like, I, in my mind, I always thought it was just, like, a toy, but it's actually meant to, like, be a tool for breathing. Yeah. It, like, mimics your lungs going in and out. I'm like, oh, that's so interesting. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and sometimes it's a nice, like, distraction of, oh, do you want to hold this breathing ball? Mm -hmm. And that will get them, um, again, subconsciously or without them knowing, yeah, we're actually going to breathe and I'm going <laughs> to calm you down. <laughs> right. So, yeah, tools are a great thing. Visuals are a super great thing as well, so. And then our last one is from Kara. How do I know when to breathe and where can I find helpful information? Okay. Um, so it's kind of like two questions. Yeah, two. Yeah. Um, so the first one kind of goes back to that adult first model, right? So we as adults can kind of tell when we are feeling dysregulated, right? You might tense up. You might get a little bit warm. And so that would be a great opportunity to recognize, hey, I might be a little bit stressed out. I'm going to take a couple deep breaths. Um, the other thing is... If maybe you say something that you didn't mean to say it that way or you know you're about to say something that might be hurtful or not helpful to the situation, that would be another really great time to just take that pause, take three deep breaths, and then come back and respond. Um, so that's kind of, I would just begin to kind of recognize changes in either what's, what's going on in your mind or in your body. Um, and then as far as resources... Yeah, we are going to bring up some resources anyways, but this kind of leads us into that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the Conscious Discipline website is a great resource for families. Um, they are they have a piece of it that's geared towards educators and how it looks in the classroom, um, but then they also have a spot. It's called Schubert's Home, um, and it gives real-life examples, whether it's postings or rituals or routines that you can put in place at home, and it looks at specific parts of the home and where to put those things and why they're important. Um, so that's a really great resource. The website also has really great articles, podcasts, and videos that are specifically directed towards parents and families and how to apply conscious discipline um, within that child family relationship so I think they even have like tools as well like the feelings chart and the feeling dolls or I don't know yeah. what they have yeah, but no, they, have they have absolutely things that you can purchase from the website um, the really nice thing about it is anything that they recommend for you to print or take or buy they have a reason behind it and how to use it and why it's important so that's super helpful yes for sure yeah um, is there anything else you'd like to add or how to help parents listening? I would just say the best way to start is just to try to take that pause for yourself so that you can start seeing the behavior that maybe your children are showing as a form of communication um, to be able to approach that situation and help them through it. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that is all we have for today. I just want to thank you, Jesse, for coming on and helping us understand more about conscious discipline. I know I've 
I've learned a lot from today. <laughs> and hopefully I can apply that to my son. So, and hopefully this helps other parents out there. Um, and if you do happen to have other questions, uh, feel free to email us at parentingpickup at nhacademy.net.